everything's upside down. Right. Power is overhead. Right. So you see the the metal buzz bar that runs the length of the, uh, the building. That's a 250 amp three phase buzz bar. That has um, uh, 32 amp breakers all the way across for each rack. And there's one on either side. A and B feeds, each rack is fed with both. And um, we'll do a quick look, look at the back in a minute and we'll get a look at, uh, at the PDUs, how, how they're wired. And um, behind you, we have what we call a, a HMI. It's a human machine interface. So it is a piece of software and a piece of technology that allows a human while in the data center to see vital statistics. Temperature, um, relative humidity, um, positive pressure, and whether or not a door is open. So as you see, someone just buzzed in there, the door opened and closed. You can see what frequency each fan is running at. Pick another one at random. 10.4 hertz, current is 0.7 of an amp, and it's detecting 22 degrees centigrade. You can go up top. This is all very similar to the um, the BMS that I showed you a little bit earlier. So it's more or less the same thing. It's just that this is without windows and all the rest of it. This is the actual uh, human interface to the data center. Let's put it back to, to normal there. Um, in this cabinet here, I won't open any of the cabinets, uh, but essentially we have a A and B fed fan board, which controls all the fans in the building. And uh, you know, if, if a, a A side PDU goes down, the B side fans go into an automatic emergency mode, and the and they'll ramp up. But it's not A and B in terms of fans. Every other fan is an A and a B fan. So in each side, you have redundancy. Uh, from a failure point of view, from a power point of view, um, and we have fail safes built in throughout. Um, these obviously are power meters. They can tell us the current draw on each phase. So um, we've, you know, there's very, very, very little power actually being consumed at the moment because the data center is in the, the pre-ramp up stages of having live equipment. In it. Now behind you, we have um, the core network for this location. So we've, we've taken two racks from phase one for the core network, and this will actually feed the entire building, and currently does actually. So we have fiber coming in from, uh, from here and from here from two separate physical locations. We had to put our own ducts in the ground, so all of this is, is completely resilient physically and logically. This is one of the, the fiber connections yeah. comes in. This is actually uh, from BT, um, so that comes in there, and that's our connection which comes back up uh, into one of our, our core routers. And essentially what that does is, that there's a, a similar box to that in Dublin, and we have a similar box to this in Dublin, and they're talking together. And they're building up a mesh. And then we have 10 gig fiber between here and the other side. Um, so we, we have an internal ring and an external ring for maximum speed, maximum availability, and maximum flexibility. Uh, in, in years gone by, we had trouble with um, you know, the flexibility of the network, the way it was designed. Um, you know, it was kind of designed for a kind of smaller uh, hosting type organization, whereas now Black Knight are a hoster and we're a carrier. Uh, we, we actually give, we, we sell bandwidth onto customers. We have customers in Carlo, we have customers out of the two data centers in Dublin. Um, we actually have one live customer hanging, hanging off this equipment already, um, the one of our neighbors here. But we, we're able to run fiber through the existing ducts that we put in into their premises. So they have a gigabit connection in their office supplied by Blackman. Um, up here we have, um, uh, this is our core access layer, which is every rack has a connection back to the core access layer. It's an aggregation point. And then there are similar switches to these in the back of the racks. We, we, I can show you those as well. And then we have up here, we have various management levels um, which are basically um, the kind of control infrastructure behind the scenes of all this, if that makes sense. So there's layers, layers of redundancy throughout. Um, even if the power went, lights would stay on, fans would stay running, etc. All that good stuff. Uh, let me see what else I'm showing you. We have CCTV cameras at um, the appropriate locations. They're, they're IP, they're streaming 24-7, 365. Um, and recorded. 
um, we have emergency fire exits, we have differential pressure sensors at either end of the building. If you see the plastic pipes coming out of those um, H and C modules on the wall, mm -hmm. they're detecting the, the pressure difference between upstairs and downstairs. Because obviously above us there is a, um, a, a giant AHU which is an air handling unit as such. Um, and the, the, it's all talking back to the central brain of the data center as such. We'll have a quick look inside the uh, one of the hot oils. I'll just give you a quick look at the back of all the equipment. Um, in the network racks, we decided to use orange power leads to indicate um, importance. So if you see an orange power lead, you never unplug it, you never touch it. Simple as that. Uh, you'll also notice the cable management is very, very neat and tidy. Um, it's all CAT6, uh, all tested end to end at the highest possible rating possible. Um, we have multiple reams of fiber coming into um, this box. This is a, a special type of fiber that you can actually tie it in a knot and you won't break it. Uh, fiber typically would be very brittle, but um, with this type of fiber that we've used here, uh, we've, we've uh, alleviated that brittle nature. Mm. Um, now, Let's see the insulation in here then. Yes, exactly. This is a hot oil. This is not going to be a nice place for a human to be. Yeah. Simple as that. Now here we have a, um, a typical network configuration in a shared hosting rack. We have two 48 port switches. Uh, well actually we have three 48 port switches. This is what we would call our public network. This is what we call a private network. And this is management and KVM. So every server we would put in here would have a minimum of three gigabit connections. We'd have front, we'd have public, private, and management. And you can also see we have Black Knight branded PDUs. And all of these are centrally wired back to a monitoring system. So we can see kilowatt hours used, the load on, on each PDU, and we can graph the load of the data center on a per rack and a, and a per pod basis, if that makes sense. Um, so when, when we install servers here, there'll be up to about 40 servers, um, and they'll all be wired back into these, these switches. And an interesting fact about these particular Juniper switches, um, typically a switch heats from front to back, and because of the nature of this data center, the hot aisles are going to be quite warm. When we ordered those from Juniper, Juniper had them back to front. Mm -hmm. So the cooling comes in the, the back and the hot air comes out the front. Okay. So sort of the opposite way around of a, of a typical switch. Because you want access to the switches in the hot aisle. You want the, you want the front to be, of the switch to be in the hot aisle. Exactly. Yeah. We call those TOR, the yeah. top of rack switches. Right. Yeah. And because they're in the hot oil, they need to take the cold air from somewhere to keep them optimum. Yeah. Now, to be fair, that equipment's probably rated up to 34 degrees centigrade operational temperature anyway. Yeah. But there's no point in... In driving it the opposite exactly. way to the way it's supposed exactly. to be. Exactly. Yeah. Because yeah. what, what you end up with is you end up putting loops of air within your, da within yeah. your cabinets, uh, yeah. which is inefficient. Um, point so. to note, in all the racks, we have sealed between them. During testing, we had blades of cold air coming through the racks and you used to actually hit these temperature sensors. Okay. See them? Yeah. And uh, what we found was, is the gap between each rack, those blades of cold air were shooting through and were telling the return air fans to ramp down. Even though the ambient air was 35 degrees, the air around them was only 24, 25 degrees because of the blades. So we've sealed in between all the racks on top and at the front, so no cold air can pass from the cold aisle, except if it's going through a piece of equipment. Yes, and we've done that throughout the data center. And as you can see, we've, we've insulation the whole way down, and that's a steel panel behind that, separating the cold oil from the hot oil. Um, and again, that's been done to maximize um, heating and cooling efficiency. We never want hot and cold air mixing. They always have to be, to be separate. So um, that's pretty much it. Again, just a few points to note. Each fan is isolated. So if I turn that off, that fan will switch off. The rest of them will go into a fail-safe mode in this aisle. Here's the noise. And two things are happening right now. 
the pilot pilot fans are ramping up, the pressure is going down, and the supply fans are going to ramp up to deal with the suckers. Now you, you can hear it's really quite noisy right now, and uh, it's almost, if you, if you can see your hair moving to the wind, I can tell the mind. If I turn that back on, almost immediately everything's back to normal. Uh, it, 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 there's a much more gentle ramp up uh, for a number of reasons. You never want to uh, increase humidity by dropping the temperature too quick and for that reason the, the fail safe is a slow ramp up rather than a, um, a full steam ahead ramp up. But you know, during our testing we, we put 100 kilowatt load with all the fans running and uh, we tested various failure modes and again you can see there's um, temperature sensor controls and differential pressure sensors between um, each extraction fan and the, um, the fan chamber above. And the reason the differential pressure sensors are there is to determine whether the fan is supplying enough air. In an ideal scenario, all of the fans should be running around the same rate and the pressure should be the same throughout. So if the pressure drops above any one of them, a couple of things could have happened. The fan might be broken, uh, the control loop could be malfunctioning or there's um, baffles above the fan one of them could get stuck because they, they flap when, when the uh, air pressure uh, increases and decreases so if, if say some of the baffles stopped working or they became lodged or dislodged or whatever um, you could have a failure mode and that's why those are there so um, that's pretty much the hot oil this was originally going to be um, just a fan chamber, but because we're humans, we kind of wanted it to be semi usable by a normal person. Mm. Here we have, um, you see these big red pipes, that's our fire suppression system. It comes in uh, a bunch of different um, uh, zones. Uh, zone one is a duct probe, so in, in the cold air supply from outside, we're sampling the air for contaminants, be it, um, let's call them smoke particles for one, uh, or other contaminants such as uh, large volumes of sand, or let's say you're in the desert for example, and you had a sandstorm coming your way, the, the zone probe, the duct probe would detect the increase in particles in the air and shut that, switch the chillers on and go full research. Um, so that's what the, the duct probe does. Then we have our, our standard fire suppression system which is actually pulling uh, air samples into the smoke heads, which are these white heads. There's, there's three in each coal mile and there's a couple dotted around different locations. They, they're smoke detectors. So there's a, that, that's the, the second control loop. And the third control loop is the slightly smaller red pipe, the plastic one that runs back into the hot oil, and that's a VESDA. It's a very, uh, very early smoke detection system, um, but it, 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 it samples so many particles per second, and if it detects uh, you know, any kind of um, particles in the air within the pod, it's able to tell us. And uh, the system's in auto manual mode, which means that someone actually has to press a button to crank out the FM200. For safety, really. Uh, but typically, if we wanted to, say there was a fire, if we were away from the building, we could tell the BMS to dump the gas. And then the fire would be put out. It starves out of oxygen, fills the room with FM200, which is non lethal to humans. There would be no oxygen in the room for up to three minutes. So uh, that's why we have fire exit push bars on, on both entrance and exit doors. So if you were, you, your hands were on fire, mm. You can back into the door and get out safely, mm. for example. Um, other interesting things of note, wireless phones, temperature sensor for the utility space, which is, is where we're standing. There's no moving air in this area. So if this gets really hot, we know something's wrong in the rest of the data center as well. Um, we've Wi-Fi throughout the building using ubiquity uh, Wi-Fi equipment. Um, another IP camera and um, various uh, parts of the fire suppression system behind you, up on the wall. That is the data center.